Hey, Jubilee, Brian Loritz here. I am so excited to jump into the Word of God with you. They want me to really just talk about the good news of Jesus Christ and the gospel and the power that brings to all of our lives. And to help us with that, I, I want you to meet me in one of my favorite passages of Scripture, one of, the, one of my favorite narratives in the life of Jesus Christ. It's tucked away in the book of Matthew and Matthew chapter 11. Look at these words with me, beginning in verse 1. When Jesus had finished instructing his disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now when John, that's John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. And the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And then just kind of make note of this sentence, verse 6. And blessed is the one who's not offended by me. And they went away, Jesus, as they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What then did you go out to see a prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force." For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John, and if you hear, if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. But to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their playmates. Verse 17, we played the flute for you, and you didn't dance. We sang a dirge, and you didn't mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, look at him. A glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. I want to talk about becoming the goat, the greatest of all time. Will you pray with me? God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the good news of Jesus Christ. I'm well aware that uh, uh, those who are viewing, who are watching right now, we probably cover the gamut. There are probably some who are tuning in and they, they grew up in the church there their story, their journey of faith begins with them becoming a follower of you at a very young age. And then there's others who they wouldn't call themselves a follower of you. God, I pray that you would use me and the power of your word, the good news of the gospel to reach everyone on the spiritual continuum. Uh, give me clarity of mind and concision of speech. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, many of us, I'm guessing, have read Ernest Hemingway's classic the Old Man and the Sea. Uh, in this classic, The Old Man and the Sea, we are introduced to the protagonist of the story, a man by the name of Santiago, who, as you can guess, is an old man who one day decides to go out to, you guessed it, the sea to go fishing. And for the next 84 consecutive days, Santiago catches nothing. Now, parenthetically, you should know this about me. If, if I'm fishing for 84 minutes and I don't catch anything, God ain't in it, pack it up, time to get to the house. But for 84 consecutive days, Santiago is fishing and he catches nothing. Well, it's a good thing he stayed around for that one more day because on the 85th day, Santiago not only catches a fish, he he lands kind of the catch of his life, a huge mar marlin. And as he's got this thing on the, on the line, he's thinking to himself, yes, wait till they see this, this fish when I get back to shore. It's, it's as if he's thinking to myself, I'm finally going to get the admiration and the accolades that have eluded me all of my life. He's so excited. But there's a couple of problems that Santiago has. One, he's an old man. He doesn't have the strength and the resources and the capacity to reel this thing all the way in inside the boat. And the second problem is because he can't get it in the boat, he decides, well, I'll just tie it to the side of the boat, leave it in the water, 
takes a spear, runs it through, he kills it, and yet as he's going back to shore, there's just this steady kind of flow of blood that now starts to attract other sharks. And what do these sharks do? They begin to eat away at the marlin so that tragically, by the time Santiago gets to shore, he has nothing to show for his journey. The greatness that he thought was his has eluded him. Now, here's the deal, Jubilee. The deal is Hemingway scholars actually tell us this story, Old Man in the Sea, it's really Hemingway being autobiographical. They're really saying that Santiago is actually Hemingway. This makes a lot of sense because if you notice anything about Hemingway and the trajectory of his life, he, he seemed to have caught the big marlins of this life. Wealth, check. Romance, check. Success, check. And yet what's interesting is for all of his greatness and success, by the time we get to the end of Hemingway's life when he's writing this story, he's on the brink of financial ruin. He's been married and divorced several times. Here's an individual who, who was addicted to alcohol. And ultimately, if you know anything about Hemingway, he would die by suicide. He would take his own life. See, what Santiago and Hemingway are teaching us is that there is no lasting meaning, value, and significance in the big marlins of this world. Nothing in this world will, it'll scratch you where your soul truly itches. If you want to read more about this, in the Bible, there's a whole book dedicated to this very theme. It's uh, the book of Ecclesiastes, which Solomon, a billionaire, many times over by today's standards in his day, he seemed to have had it all. Women, check. Wealth, check. Possessions, check. And yet over and over and over again, he says in this book of Ecclesiastes, vanity of vanities. All is vanity. The idea of the word vanity there, it's emptiness. He's just merely affirming what Hemingway and Santiago are screaming at us. There is no lasting happiness, joy, or fulfillment, meaning, true greatness in life found in the things of this life. I know some of you are thinking, well, Brian, let me find that out on my own. Let me, let me just make my first billion dollars. I'm trying to tell you it is a truism to life. I want you to hear me as we come to this text. Jesus is all for our fulfillment. He's all for our sense of meaning and value and significance. He's all for our aspirations for being the greatest in this life. Notice Jesus doesn't critique greatness. He doesn't critique our desire for it at all. What the Bible critiques is how we go about it. Now, I know for some of you, this is kind of an uncomfortable you know, notion or conversation, the idea of me wanting to pursue greatness in life. Um, you know, maybe you have images of Muhammad Ali, who, let's just face it, wasn't the most humble person uh, on the face of the earth. In fact, one of my favorite Ali stories is a time in which he was on an airplane that was experiencing some turbulence, this heavyweight champion of the world. The captain comes over the PA system and says, listen, I need everybody to move to their seats and fasten their seatbelt. We're experiencing turbulence. The flight attendant notices that Ali doesn't have his seatbelt fastened and so she bends down whispers in his ear so as not to embarrass him Mr. Ali please fasten your seatbelt to which he responds Superman don't need no seatbelt to which she responds Superman don't need no airplane now please fasten your seatbelt I love that story and yet for all of Ali's endearing qualities he wasn't known as being a humble individual and so maybe when you hear this idea of being the greatest you're like wait a minute that doesn't sound quite right or maybe when you hear this idea of being the greatest, maybe you're thinking of kind of conversations we're having right now of who is the GOAT when it comes to basketball. Is it Michael Jordan or LeBron? And we, of course, know that all of the truly redeemed people would say Michael Jordan. I mean, if you don't say Michael Jordan, I've got to check your salvation. So maybe you're wrestling with that. I think Simone Biles is teaching us, the great gymnast, to lengthen the conversation of who is the greatest of all time to not just what they do uh, on the floor of competition, but but maybe being the greatest is taking care of your mental health or taking some time out, being a good teammate and cheering them on. Notice, if you will, Jesus does not critique greatness. 
the problem the Bible has is where you're fishing for it. If your ultimate sense of value and meaning and success, if what you mean by greatness is found in the temporary joys and pleasures of this life, you'll never be satisfied. But if you're fishing in the seas of eternity, if, if what really matters to you is linked to what really matters to God and his son Jesus, that's where greatness is. As our text opens up, we're introduced to a character by the name of John the Baptist. Again, he's the cousin of Jesus. Uh, when we find John the Baptist, it's very important that you understand this. John the Baptist, in this story, he actually starts out in prison. Why is he there? There's a political leader uh, in John the Baptist's day uh, in which John the Baptist becomes embroiled into the greatest political scandal of, uh, of his lifetime. There's a guy by the name of Herod. He's actually king of the Jews. He's king of the Jews under Roman sovereignty. The Romans, by the way, allowed Herod to have a measure of authority and rule under their authority and rule. Herod was not a nice person. Uh, in fact, uh, Herod actually seduced his own brother's wife, took her away from his brother, leading to the divorce of their marriage, and then took her to be his wife. John the Baptist, being the man of conviction that he was, just couldn't stand by and, and just kind of watch this go uh, idly by. John the Baptist actually had to say something, and so John the Baptist calls out the sin. Herod responds by throwing him in prison. And please notice what Jesus says about his cousin while his cousin is in prison. He says of him, look at it again in verse 11, Truly I say to you, among these bo those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. It's amazing. He calls him the goat while he's in prison. Hear me. Jesus is teaching us that greatness can never be found in our circumstances. Greatness can never be found in our circumstances. I, I was talking to a friend of mine, uh, gosh, you know, about a year or so ago. They had been going through a very difficult time. They had lost their job and family drama and just a whole litany of things. And so in the middle of all this, I called to check in on them, and my friend wasn't there, but his wife was there, and so I just said, how's it going? And she just kind of launched into just pulling us into, pulling me into kind of what they're experiencing, and to be honest with you, it was an even darker picture than what I originally knew. Uh, they were about to get evicted from their home, the money problems were worse, the family drama had heightened, and, uh, and then she just kind of dropped this zinger of a line. She said, Brian, what we're, what we're learning in the middle of all this is that circumstances are a horrible foundation to build one's life on. Circumstances are a horrible foundation to build one's life on. Some of us are figuring that out right now. Maybe some of you, you're just going, man, I just found out my parents are filing for divorce, and man, the rug has just been, been uh, ripped out from under me. What I thought was was a stable environment, isn't a stable environment at all. Maybe others of you, you, you know failure um, in your career or as a college student. Uh, others of you, maybe there's some addictions that you're experiencing, or maybe there's a breakup that you're going through, or whatever it may be. You need to know that greatness is never ultimately found in our circumstances. That actually works the other way. Uh, maybe some of you are going, I'm not having bad circumstances. I'm actually in a season of life where life is going well. I can tell you of plenty of people who, who are working the dream job, making all the money, driving the dream car, and I want you to understand that greatness is not ultimately found in your circumstances. You're going to always need someone beyond your circumstances to tether your life through because circumstances, by very definition, are finicky. Permit me just a few more moments to press this point a little bit more. Here's John, and he's in prison, and our story opens up with John sending his disciples to Jesus with a question. He says, go ask Jesus, are you the one or shall we look for another? Now, I just got to tell you, that blows my mind. Why? Because again, John the Baptist and Jesus, the Messiah, are cousins. 
In fact, there's a story in the Bible in the opening chapters of Luke where uh, John's mother, a woman named Elizabeth, is pregnant with John. Elizabeth goes to visit uh, her cousin Mary, who's pregnant with Jesus. And when Elizabeth, who has John in utero, is in the presence of the Messiah, just sensing the Messiah's presence, John the Baptist is doing backflips in his mother's womb. And now you're going, are you the one? You want to go, hey, wait a minute, John, just in Matthew chapter 3, you baptized Jesus. I mean, you were there when the heavens opened up and you saw the Spirit descend on Jesus as a dove and you heard God's voice say, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And now you're doubting? Now you're going, are you the one? I think this is important. I I, I don't care how much knowledge you gain about Christ. I'll say it this way. I have a Bible college degree, a master's degree, and a doctorate degree, all in the area of theology. But I can tell you, I don't care how much knowledge you glean about God in Christ, there will be moments in your life when you experience the valleys of life. And if you're really honest with yourself, you'll go, hey, Jesus, are, are you the one? Are you who you say you are? I can't tell you how many couples I know who've grown up in church who are experiencing infertility and they're going in so many words, are you real? I can tell you of individuals who have taught the Bible studies and tried to lead their kids the best they know how, but their kids are out in the far country being rebellious and there's this sense in which they go, are you the one? I love Jesus' response. Jesus responds by saying in verse 4, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the good news preached to them. Now, scholars will tell you that Jesus is actually giving John a cryptic message. What do you mean by that? What Jesus is conveying to John, scholars say, is actually based on his first sermon that he preached. And I want you to hear a couple verses from the first sermon that he preached that John would have known. In Luke 4, it says this. This is Jesus talking. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. In his first sermon, it's almost exactly of what Jesus just said to John. But this first sermon, he says that God's called him to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Now, this idea of setting the captives free or setting people at liberty, he now leaves out in this message. Everything else is the same. Here's what he's saying. John, you're asking me if you're the one, if I'm the one, and you're in prison. Yes, I am the one. And the fact that he leaves out the fact about the captive being set free, it's his way of saying, I am the one. And no, John, you're not getting out of jail. Your circumstances won't change. Friends, I just need to tell you this. You will have times in your life when your situation is really tough. It's really dire. You will question, God, are you who you say you are? You will pray and cry and pray and cry. There will be, there will be times when Jesus will come through the midnight hour and you will get exactly what you're praying for, but... There will be times, the fact that we all die is proof of this. When you'll go through something and you'll pray and you'll plead and Jesus is saying, yes, I am the one and no, I'm not going to heal you of cancer. Yes, I am the one. And no, I'm not going to step in and change this situation. Here's what I want to ask you. Will you still follow him? See, I want to give you the fine print of Christianity. Christianity, we don't follow Jesus for the benefits package. We follow him because he's he's worthy. Jesus is helping us understand that greatness is not found in our circumstances. Let me give you two more real quickly. Secondly, he wants us to understand that greatness is not found in our status. Jesus now turns to the crowd and says these words, beginning in verse 7. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? Speaking of John the Baptist, a reed shaken by the wind. What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? 
The idea of soft clothing, back then, you, when you saw a person who wore soft clothing, you knew that they were associated with the king. Typically, they were couriers of the king. They delivered messages to and from the king. And you could tell so by the way they dressed. It was a symbol of status. Jesus is saying John the Baptist didn't wear soft clothing. In fact, if you want to know what John the Baptist wore, Matthew 3, 4 says this. Now, John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. I just want you to imagine, guys, let's, let's say you've got a daughter. Maybe at some point you'll have a daughter. You get a knock on the door. You open up the door. There's a guy who looks disheveled. And you're going, hey, how are you? And he says, hey, my name is John. He goes, I, I want you to know, sir, I've been dating your daughter for a while, really love her, and I've come to ask your permission to marry her. And you're like, wow, this is interesting. I've never heard of you before. And you start asking him some questions. Well, what do you do? He says, well, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a preacher. Where's your church? Uh, we're in the middle of the wilderness. Uh, we don't really have a building. Well, where do you live? I live near my church in the wilderness. I, I, I don't really have a, have a home to live in. Again, he looks disheveled and you're looking at what he's wearing, and you find out his diet is locusts and wild honey. Later on, you Google him, and you discover he's about to be thrown in jail for coming against a political leader. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess you're going to be like, yeah, thanks, but no thanks. You're not good enough for my daughter. Undeterred, a couple weeks later, he comes back with his cousin, knocks on the door. You're like, yeah, who's this? It's my cousin Jesus. And you find out that his cousin Jesus is in his 30s. He's homeless. He's rejected by most. You Google him, you find out that he's on his way to get crucified. I'm going to guess you're still going to turn down John the Baptist's requests. Here's what I want you to understand. Jesus is teaching us greatness is not found in our status. So you can go out and try to find status by the world's standards. Again, how much money you make, where you live, what you drive. You'll never be satisfied. Greatness isn't found there. Let's go one more before I tell you where greatness is found. Thirdly, Jesus wants us to understand greatness is not found in religion. In order to get at this, you have to understand that Matthew, the primary audience Matthew writes to are the Jews, very religious people. In fact, the Jews were some of the most moral religious people to have ever walked the face of the earth. The average Jew had memorized the first five books of the Bible. That's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Leviticus, Leviticus. Numbers in Deuteronomy, the average Jew gave over 19% of their annual income to the Lord. The average Jew was in the synagogue every week at the temple, worshiping on high and holy days. And yet, hear it now, the fact that, the fact that Matthew writes his gospel to religious people tells us that the gospel and religion are not the same. Religious people work for approval, Gospel people work from approval. Uh, for, for the religious person, it's, it's all about works. For the gospel person, it's, it's all about grace. Religious is, religion is all about what I do. And the gospel, we just rest in the fact that he says it is finished. The gospel and religion are two different ways of viewing and doing life. The great tragedy of hell is so many people will be there who will be extremely religious in this lifetime, but never embrace the good news of Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus would go on to say of him and John, we, we, were, like, we were like children, man. We were hanging out in the streets. We, we, we played the flute, he says, and you didn't dance. It's an idiom of what would happen at weddings when you heard the flute playing. That was your cue to get on the dance floor and do the Cupid shuffle or electric slide. You heard the, the, uh, the flute? That means you should dance. He said, we sang the dirge. You didn't mourn. Here's what he's saying. We came to you bringing the gospel. This is what he's saying to these religious people. We came to you bringing the gospel, and you rejected then he goes on to say some of the most complex words, verse 12, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence and the violent take it by force. Now that we understand that he's talking to religious people, bringing the gospel, they didn't respond, we can rightly divide this very hard verse. Who are, who are the violent here? The violent here are religious people who when Jesus came to bring the gospel, they said, thanks, but no thanks. We're going to do it our way. We're going to have it our way. Maybe this little corny illustration will help get at what Jesus is talking about. 
Um, imagine I take you out to a steak dinner. I'm like, hey, me and you, let's go get a steak, my dime. And we go out, we, we order steak, man, and um, we're sitting there. The waiter comes, takes our order, and you go, man, I want a filet mignon. I'm high-fiving you. I'm like, yes, do it. And then the waiter says, um, how would you like it prepared? And you have the audacity to say, well done. And I'm like going out of my mind now. I'm like, let me just stop you right now. That cow did not die for you to burn it. You don't want to do that. You want uh, at least min uh, uh, a medium. And, and you're like, no, 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 I, I, I want medium. I, I want well done. And we're going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And you are just adamant. You're going to have it your way. And I'm forced to conclude you are doing violence to that cow. That's religious people. Religious people, at the end of the day, I'm just going to do it my way. Religious people are like the elder brother in the parable of... Uh, the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15, where this elder brother is near his father's house. And he's like, man, I'm just going to do it my way. Jesus says that person goes to hell. And that's some of you. You're very moral people. You go to church. You come to the conferences. You know this stuff. But if you really tell the truth, it's not here. You have head knowledge, but there's no heart, there's no desire, there's no passion. The good news is here, it hasn't traveled the 18 inches here. Well, if greatness, Brian, isn't found in my circumstances, if it's not found in my status, if it's not found in religion, where can it be found? Let's go home on this one. Jesus again says of John the Baptist, verse 11, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist, yet the one who is least of these is, uh, the, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. That's a bold statement. You want to go, wait a minute, Jesus. You're saying John the Baptist is the goat, the greatest of all time? What about Abraham, the great father of our faith, who in great faith left Ur of the Chaldees and followed you? Are you saying John the Baptist is greater than him? Absolutely. What about Moses, the great legendary liberator and lawgiver to the people of God? Are you saying John the Baptist is greater than him? Yes. What about Rahab? I mean, here she is in great faith. She just trusts you. Even when the walls of Jericho were coming down, are you saying John the Baptist is greater than her? Absolutely. Absolutely. What about Elijah and Elisha? Here were individuals who performed exponentially more miracles than, than John the Baptist. Are you saying John the Baptist is greater than them? Absolutely. Well, what makes John the Baptist different? Jesus is helping us to understand what makes John the Baptist different than any other person in history up until that point was that John the Baptist's life was inextricably tied to Jesus Christ. John the Baptist was called to be the forerunner to Jesus. And what he is saying here is, if your life is tied to Jesus, you are, you are the goat. That's why he goes on to say, and the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven, which means this, if you're a follower of Jesus, you are in the kingdom of heaven, and the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is even greater than John the Baptist. Why? Because our life is linked to Jesus. I lived in Memphis for years, pastored there. If you know anything about Memphis, it's um, frequently on a television show called The First 48, which is all about murders. Memphis has a high murder rate. And yet I gotta tell you, for all of the murderers that have lived in Memphis, I can only name one name, James Earl Ray. You know why I know that name? Not because James Earl Ray stood out, not because of the method he used to kill somebody. I only know that name because of who he killed on April 4th, 1968. He killed Martin Luther King Jr. And because Dr. King left a legacy and James Earl Ray's life was tied to Dr. King, James Earl Ray leaves a legacy. You wanna leave a legacy of greatness can't be found in your car can't be found where you live, can't be found in money, can't be found in your GPA, can't be found in anything else but Jesus Christ. Link your life to his, and you'll find greatness, significance, meaning, joy, satisfaction you never knew was possible.
God, thanks for Jubilee. Thanks for your word. Thanks for the power of it. Lord, I pray that we would live into this great calling of ours to link our lives to you. I pray for anyone, Lord God, who doesn't know you as Lord and Savior. I'm not saying they don't know things about you. Again, religious people know things about you, but they have not embraced the good news of Jesus Christ. I pray that they would cry out to you today that they are a sinner in need of your grace and that Jesus, by the person and power of your spirit, you will step into their lives. It's in his name we pray. Amen.